Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Amen. Amen. Thanks, um, uh, Canon, for that song. Amen. 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 That was beautiful. Um, my name's um, Orion. Orion Carr. Um, I'm a member of a ministry called Preaching Place um, with my brother Josh. Um, it's a blessing to be here uh, for the first night of In This Generation. Um, and as Josh said, we encourage you guys to um, come back next week, you know, if you can. If you're able to, invite your friends. Um, and tonight we're just going to study God's Word. We're going to get straight into it. So I want, um, invite you to bow your heads with me and pray And um, as we study God's Word. So let's bow our heads. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we just want to thank you so much. Um, as Canon just sung, Lord, that uh, you've given us the experience um, of a refiner's fire. And Lord, we know that every single one of us is going through that, um, through the various trials and experiences that we are going through even this week. Lord, we just want to pray that as it is your Sabbath, Lord, you might give us the rest that you want to give us. Um, Lord, and as we open your word, we pray that you might open now our eyes, that we might behold wondrous things out of your word. Give us your Holy Spirit, Father, um, that we might understand truth and by your grace live out your truth and go home um, in this generation, Lord. Uh, thank you for hearing our prayer. May your angels abide with us and may um, you hedge around us, Lord. Um, speak to our hearts, Lord, and may Jesus be uplifted and may we be more attracted to Christ and his love after this study. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, um, a few things, just if you have a phone, please um, turn it off just for the, you know, as we study. Um, secondly, if you don't have a Bible, please grab a Bible. Um, one of my friends once said, you know, um, it's better that you come to church without shoes than without your Bible. Amen. Is that true? It's better you come to church without shoes than without your Bible. Because you don't want to just hear what a man says. So the message today, it's 8.13. The message today is entitled, um, God's Heart Breaks Too. Now, um, we're going to be studying God's Word today. And we're going to open this session in this generation with a study about God and the work we have to do. So I want us to begin in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, this text um, is... Where we're going to begin today, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And as you guys go there, I want to quote a passage which is found in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. Now in Matthew 24, verse 14, we're going to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. But I'm quoting uh, Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. Um, before we read that, I want to read this verse here. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, for a witness unto all nations, and then what? The end shall what? Come. So that verse makes it clear that there is a cause and there's an effect. The cause, the thing that will cause the end to come is what? The gospel will be preached where? Just in uh, Marrickville? Everywhere. Everywhere in the whole world. So we see that there is a cause and there's an effect. What's the effect? We want the end to what? Come. We see the disasters in the Philippines. We see the typhoons and the tsunamis and the earthquakes that are sweeping planet Earth. And everybody in this world, including people in the church, they want the end to come. And the Bible makes it clear that something has to happen. And what has to happen? The gospel has to go where? To the whole world. Now, this is not just any gospel, but it's the three angels' messages. Everlasting gospel. Josh said it. When you read the book, um, Testimonies to the Church, volume 9, page 19, Alan White writes, nothing else is to absorb our attention besides these messages. And so this is so important because we see we want the, the, the disasters to end. We want the, the havoc on earth to finish. But God says there is a work to do to bring that about. Does that make sense? There's a work that we need to do. And 1 Corinthians chapter 15 tells us what the gospel will do when it is preached. Are we there? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, are we there? The Bible says there, reading verse 1, the Bible says there, what does it say? Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, that also ye have received, and what? Wherein ye stand. So what's he talking about? What's Paul preaching here in this verse? The gospel, right? And we see that the gospel has to go where so that the end might come? To the whole world world but notice the function or notice what the gospel can do in the life of an individual when it is preached what does it say in verse 2 in verse 2 it says by which also are ye saved so by the gospel the gospel will bring about an experience of salvation does that make sense 
That's why Romans chapter 1, write this down, we're not going to go there, but this is why Romans chapter 1 verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? For it is the power of God unto what? Salvation, that's the same as being saved, right? It is the power of God unto salvation to anyone? To those that believe. Romans chapter 1 verse 16, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, first we saw that the gospel must go to the whole world so the end might come. But the reason why the gospel must go is because in the gospel is found power to bring about salvation. Does that make sense? And it's not just any gospel, but it's the everlasting gospel. That's why we're here as Seventh-day Adventists. But notice what Paul said, it's to them that believe. Now, when you read James chapter 2, verse 19, the Bible says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. So that means that to believe in Christ is not just to confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. Because Satan confesses that Jesus is the most high. When the, demonic, when the demoniacs came to Jesus and Gadarenes, they fell down, they were inside the demoniac, and they fell before Jesus, and they said, Hey, what have we to do with you, son of the what? Most high. And so we see that everyone, people must receive an opportunity to accept the gospel and to believe it so that they might experience salvation. Are we following? Amen. Does that make sense? Now, understanding this, go to Romans chapter 10. In Romans chapter 10, we see something that God wants to bring to our attention. If the gospel has to go to the whole world because the gospel has in it the power of God unto salvation to those that believe, People need to have an opportunity to actually believe. Does that make sense? If people need to receive salvation and to accept it, they need to receive an opportunity to do that, right? Does that make sense? Now go to Romans chapter 10. We're going to read verses 13 to 15. And I want you guys to think. Think, think, think. God gave us minds to think. Amen? God gave us minds to think. That's why we go to school. We get educated. We learn a, learn a trade. Because God gave us a mind to think. So are we following so far? Yes. Amen. Now, Romans chapter 10 now deals with this question. If the gospel has power in it to bring salvation, and if the gospel has to go to the whole world so that someone might accept it and it might bring about the end, how is the gospel going to get to the world? Romans 10, are we there? Yes. Verse 13, are we there? Yes. Please say amen when you're there so I know you're there. Amen. amen. Verse 13. The Bible says, read with me. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be what? Saved. Shall be saved. Verse 14, we're going to read. Now, what did it say? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be what? Saved. saved. And salvation comes as a result of accepting the message found in the everlasting gospel. And the gospel will go to the whole world so that the end might come. But then the question is, how is the gospel even going to get to the world? What does it say in verse 14? Paul addresses this question. It says in verse 14, he says there, How then shall they believe, call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him in whom they have not what? Heard. And how shall they hear without a preacher? Verse 15, read verse 15 with me. And how shall they preach except they be what? Sent. Then it says there, As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of what good things so here paul makes a very practical question and analysis and he says listen yes the gospel must go to the world yes so that the end might come and the tsunamis the disasters and the deaths yea the innocent deaths may stop but somebody's got to take it somebody's got to take it to the world amen, amen. somebody's got to take it now notice the statement found in Christ Object Lessons, page 229, paragraph 3. It says there, we are not to wait for souls to come to us. We must seek them out where they are. When the word of God has been preached from the pulpit, the work has just what? Begun. begun. Not, not finished. The work has just begun. Why? Because Paul said, how shall they believe on him whom they have not heard? Um, um, uh, how shall they call on him on whom, in whom they have not heard? Uh, believed and how shall they believe on him in whom they have not heard and how shall they hear except what without a preacher and how shall he preach except he be what 
sent. So God makes it practical that someone, people need to be sent to the world so that the world might have an opportunity to accept the message of salvation in the everlasting gospel. Does that make sense? Amen. Now it says here, there are multitudes who will never be reached, who will never be reached by the gospel unless it is carried to them. There are people that are sitting in their homes that are waiting to hear about Christ. There are people that are sitting on the street lonely and cold. And God says, we are not to just to come to church every Sabbath and just socialize here and forget about the world. I've been to churches where churches have not done outreach for three years. They have not used their capabilities that God has given. And God says, do you know what we're told? Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 14, he says, For I am a debtor both to the Jew, uh, both to the um, Greeks and to the barbarians. Paul found it a necessity that as God had given him an opportunity to accept salvation in the gospel, so he should transfer that opportunity and go and share it with someone else. The question is this, as people that are followers of Christ, are we carrying the gospel to the world? When we go to school, when we go to work, do we go and do we partake of all the foolishness that the people talk about or are we there to be a light for Christ? When we're at school and people are talking foolishly about rubbish, about the, the things of the world, do we join in or do we stand separate and peculiar? When we go about and we're hanging around, what example are we giving? Are we doing anything for Christ? Are we following? Now, I want us to understand this by going to the book of Revelation chapter 21. In Revelation chapter 21, Revelation chapter 21, God brings out something here in Revelation chapter 21. In Revelation chapter 21, God brings out a point. So the first point is this. I want you to take, the, we're going to look at five points. How many points did I say? Five, five points. How many? Five. five. Now, the first point is this. The gospel commission has been placed in our hands to fulfill. Because God said that the gospel must go to the world, that the end might come. But Paul says, how can the gospel even go if nobody actually goes? So that's a commission to the church. That's a commission to the church. The church needs to be more than a social place. It needs to be social so it can bring others to be social with them. And so God brings about now in Revelation chapter 21, what will be the earth be like? What state will God bring about once the gospel has done its work? And what is, what is it going to be like? Are we there? Yeah. Revelation chapter 21, we're reading verses 1 to 4. Are we there? Uh, 1 and 4. Are we there? Yeah. Amen? Amen? Just want to make sure everyone's there, so we're reading. Because you don't know if I'm making these verses up. Revelation 21, verse 1 to 4. The Bible says in verse 1, John in vision says this, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Why? For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. So Paul, they, um, John here in vision says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Why? Because the old earth and the old heaven are passed away. So this is after the end of the world. Because why? That first world has ended, and there's a new earth and a new heaven. Amen? Amen. And this is why God tells us that the gospel must go, because this will be the state of time that, will, that, that we will see if by His grace we're saved. We will see a time where there's no more typhoons, there's no more tsunamis, there's no more things happening, and tonight we're going to see something about God that is going to comfort us. Because friends, these are hard times. These are serious times. One of my family members who has not been in church for years spoke to me this week and says, Orion, I know we're living in the last days. I know we're living in the last generation. And now go to verse 4. I want you to see this. In verse 4, we see in detail the things that will not be in this new earth. So we're going to see what, what will be in this new earth, what won't be. Are we there in verse 4? Yes. The Bible says there, And God shall wipe away every tear, for all their tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things have what? Passed away. Passed away. Now, after the gospel has gone, and people have received the rejected salvation, and then the whole plan of the whole great controversy ends, the world will then be in a, in a state in the new earth where there'll be no more pain, sorrow, death, crying, no more typhoons. Does that make sense? Yes. And so we can rejoice, amen? amen. That's, that, amen. 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 There's no more of that. Amen. I would love a world where there's no more demons, devil, 
you know, none of this. Now, this is the point. Many times when we think about finishing the gospel and going to heaven, this is what we think about. We think about self. We think, oh, yes, for me, I'm going to walk on the streets of gold. There's nothing wrong with being void, with being in a world where there's no pain. Amen? Amen. That's what God promised us. God was going to wipe away our tears. But I, wanted to, I want us to understand that tonight there is a deeper focus that is involved that we need to keep in our mind as we carry the gospel to the world. Because many times people want to preach and share just because they want to exit their suffering. Just because they want to go and walk the streets of gold. Many times it's just so they can be in a place. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to be in a place with Jesus forever. Amen? But there's a deeper focus. And this focus is found in the book of, um, is found in the book of Isaiah chapter 63. In Isaiah chapter 63, I want us to notice something. I want us to see something in Isaiah chapter 63. Go to the book of Isaiah chapter 63. And in Isaiah chapter 63, we're going to see something here. Isaiah chapter 63, we're going to see something in the book of Isaiah chapter 63. Now friends, there were thousands that lost their lives in that Philippine disaster. And the reason why I bring it up is because friends, this is very real suffering. And But this is why there is something that we're going to see tonight. Remember the message. God's heart breaks too. Our hearts break when we see suffering and pain. Amen? Amen. Our hearts break to see other individuals from other sides of the world dying innocently. And we see that something real is happening and earth is going downward. But God says that a people will take the everlasting gospel to the world. Why? To bring about an end to all this. Do you now see why it is so important to understand the commission? Because our work is what hinges on the end coming. And the end will be a state where there's no more pain, suffering, or death. So that means you and I have been placed with a responsibility to have a role to bring about the end of all this mess. God has put it in our hands in cooperation with Him to bring about the end. Does that make sense? And in the end and in the new earth, there will be no more pain. There will be no more sorrow, no more suffering. So instead of coming to church, dilly dallying, God wants us to be fully for him. Not half his, wholly his. Now in Isaiah chapter 63, I want us to see something. Many times when we think about suffering and pain, we think about it in relation to ourselves. We think, which is true, that, will, that God will wipe away whose tears? All our tears from our eyes. But friends, I want us to see something tonight that is going to help us to refocus and add to that picture. Are we there in Isaiah chapter 63 verse 9? Isaiah chapter 63 verse 9, are we there? The Bible says there, speaking of Israel, of God's people, in all their affliction, read that with me. He was what? Afflicted. Let me read that again. In all their affliction, what? He. Who's the he? Jesus. God. Did you catch that? In all their affliction, who was afflicted? He was afflicted. So friends, in the tsunamis and the typhoons, who was being afflicted even today? Jesus Christ. Did you catch what we're just reading? In that verse, in their affliction, he was afflicted. So that is to say that the suffering that will be gone is not just man's suffering, but God's suffering. God's heart breaks too. Go to Judges chapter 10. I want you to see this too. Another verse, Judges chapter 10. Joshua, Judges. We're going to Judges chapter 10, and we're going to be reading verse uh, 16. Judges chapter 10, verse 16. I want you to see this. Because, friends, many times when we think about taking the gospel to the world, our motivation is that I want my suffering to stop. I want my issues to stop. I want my pain to stop. But, friends, what about God's pain? What about the pain that God goes through? What about the pain that He goes through? And we're going to see that there is something powerful about God's love in this picture. Judges chapter 10, are we there? What does the Bible say there? And they put away the strange gods from what? Among them, and his soul was grieved for what? The Judges chapter 10, verse 16. Read it with me. Let's read again. Are you there? Yeah. The Bible says there, Judges 10, 16. It says, and they put away the strange gods from among them, and what? His soul was what? Grieved for who? Judges chapter 10, verse 16. Are we there? 
the, the end of the verse I'm reading. And his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. God grieves too. God's heart grieves too. So when things are happening on earth, when people are deciding to commit suicide, when people are trying to drug themselves up for a hit, high hit, God suffers too. God is not separate from the suffering. Are we following? Yeah. The suffering that happens on earth, God is not separate from it. So we need to keep in the picture, yes, we want the end to come, amen? Amen. Why? Because there will be the end of no more death, sorrow, suffering, crying, or pain. Amen? Amen? But then we see that so many times we focus on our pain, our issues, our suffering, but God suffers too. God suffers too. And that's so comforting to know that when I'm suffering, God is not separate from suffering. God does not sit back and go, wow, look at these people suffering. No. God does not do that. What did, what did God say in Genesis chapter 6? We're not going to go there, but I'm going to quote it. What happened in Genesis chapter 6? It was the flood. And the flood did what? It wiped out the wicked from the earth, save the eight precious souls. But what happened, Genesis chapter 6, I want you to hear this. Write this down. We're not going to go there for sake of time. But Genesis chapter 6, another third instance of God grieving, suffering with man. Genesis chapter 6 verse 5, the Bible says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that, the, that every th imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now notice verse 6 of Genesis chapter 6. It says, and, what? and it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. God's heart breaks too. God's heart breaks too. And the reason why I brought this message tonight is because in this generation, we want to do a work to take the everlasting gospel to the world in this generation so that the end might come of suffering, pain, and death. But friends, the focus is yes, our pain and suffering will stop, but God's too. God's too. Many times we think of ourselves. Many times you think, I'm suffering. Friends, when you're crying, no, this is a powerful statement. Read this next one. This is found in the book Amazing Grace, page 189, paragraph 5. Can you read it? Can you see it? Yes. Amen. Now, this is deep. Read it with me. It says, Not a sigh is breathed, not a pain is felt, not a grief pierces the soul, but the throb vibrates to the Father's heart. Let me read that again. Not a sigh is breathed. When you sigh, when you and I might cry, not a sigh of yours is breathed. Well, if you sigh this week because of the trouble, listen to, listen to how God feels with you. This is deep. Not a sigh is breathed. Not a pain felt. Did you feel pain this week? If you felt pain this week from some kind of suffering, notice the God we serve. Not a pain felt. It says, not a grief pierces the soul, but the throb vibrates to the Father's heart. If that's not love, I don't know what is. That is love. Because friends, why? This tells me that the suffering that God has been going through didn't begin on the cross. It didn't begin in Gethsemane, nor did it even begin when He, when he came here as a man. It began as soon as sin began. Did you catch that? God has been, God's heart has been broken long before you were, you were even born. Because sin separates him from his people and it draws a distinct barrier to his people and God's heart breaks. Do you know how deep that is? Do you know when an individual says to God, you know, God, I, I'm, I don't want you and they reject him. Do you think that breaks God's heart? That breaks God's heart. But God does not get broke. God gets slapped in the head and he gets broken. And God not only takes the rap, he even suffers with that person. So every pain felt, this is powerful because why? Every pain that was felt in that typhoon, God felt every person's piece of pain. That's deep. Many times when the atheistic world, the skeptic world looks at this controversy, they look at God as being separate from suffering. God is not separate from the suffering. Do you know every individual that died in that, in that typhoon, God felt every single inch of pain? What, why is this key? Because, friends, God suffers too. God is suffering too. And that is very key because that is wonderful to know that a God of love is above us. God's heart breaks too. Go to the book as we close of Romans chapter 8. 
Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, we're going to read a verse. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. We began the message by saying that God, the, the gospel has to go where? Come on, speak to me. The gospel has to go where? To the whole world. Preach as a witness, and then what? The end will come. The end will come. But then we see that the gospel, why does it need to go to the whole world? Because God wants to give every individual an opportunity to receive salvation. Amen? Amen. Then Paul makes it clear and he makes it abundant. Why? Because in the gospel is power to bring about the experience of salvation. Amen? Amen. And then he says, now, if that power needs to be experienced by the world, people need to first have an opportunity to believe. Then Paul says, how can they believe if they've never heard? And how can they not hear if the preacher's not sent? Then it says, how beautiful are the feet of them that bring, preach the gospel of peace, bring glad tidings of good things. Amen? Amen? And then he says, that is the key. Friends, we want the end to come, but what are we doing? We want the end to come, but what are we doing? You know, many times we act like the disciples. Acts chapter 1, the, dis the disciples came to Christ and they said, Lord, when shall the kingdom of Israel be restored unto us? Do you know what Jesus said? It's not for you to know. It's not for you to know. And many times we want to cry out and say the wickedness in the world is going rampant, which is, it's true, right? Even in the church. That's why 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 4, speak, and 5 speaks of a form of godliness with no power. But then we see that God himself said that at the end of this world, there would be a state where there would be a, a new heaven and a new, a new heaven and a new what? Come on. Earth. Amen. Just making sure, making sure that we're following. A new heaven and a new earth. And in that new heaven and new earth, there would be no more pain, suffering, sorrow, and sin. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But then we saw that the suffering that will be ended is not just man's suffering, but God's suffering. God's suffering because God's heart breaks too. And then we now see that at the end of this great controversy, God is going to bring about a state of this world where we can live in eternity with Jesus. Amen? But we're in Acts chapter 8, or uh, Romans chapter 8. Are we there? Romans chapter 8, as we close. Romans 8. Romans chapter 8. Are we there? Verse 22. Romans chapter 8, verse 22. Are we there? The Bible says this. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth together in pain until when? Until now. So even nature itself suffers under the curse of sin. Do you know the very root of suffering is sin? Whether directly or indirectly. Whether directly or indirectly, it's because of sin. And you know, someone once said it like this. God, the thing that God loves the most, no, the thing that God hates the most is inside the thing that God loves the most. Let me say that again. The thing that God hates the most, sin, is inside the thing that God loves the most. That's why God has to perform a cancer operation to get rid of sin. That's why we have a message called the sanctuary. Because the sanctuary says in Exodus chapter 25 verse 8, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Why? Because sin has broken the connection. And then we see now in Romans chapter 8 that even the whole creation groans together. You know, this is why there's tsunamis and typhoons. Because as the moral laws of God have been broken, read Isaiah chapter 24, verses 4 through 7, you'll see that. The whole earth groans together. As God's moral law was broken, the natural law has gone out of sync too. This whole planet is out of sync, not simply because God wants it, but because God wants to get rid of sin. But sin, the thing that God hates the most, is inside the thing He loves the most, you and I. That's why it's such an issue, this controversy. That's why God is letting things go on, because He has to do things in a just way. God has to give everyone the opportunity. God doesn't want typhoons, but we brought about typhoons on this earth. Sin has caused a disconnect and has caused a corruption in the laws that govern this universe. And therefore, because sin is at the root of this, that's why the people need the gospel. Because the gospel is the power of God unto what? salvation to those that believe then when the gospel goes through the whole world the end comes the end of suffering sorrow pain and death not just for man but for god does that make sense and as we close i want us to go to the book of jeremiah chapter 3 final verse 
Jeremiah chapter 3, as I close. Jeremiah chapter 3, this is our final passage for the night. Jeremiah chapter 3. You know what saddens me? I was on YouTube the other day, just yesterday, or the day before. And in Jeremiah chapter 3, we read our final passage. You know, I was on YouTube yesterday and I saw this thing. Uh, I can't remember what, you know, these Adventists. They were making mockery of our doctrine, making mockery of the message we have, saying we shouldn't be called the remnant. It's foolishness. God has called this church for a reason. Because no other church has been called to take these three angels' messages to the world. Because when you read the book, this is deep. Read, don't, we're not going to go there, but read 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12 says this, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. We're, I'm just quoting this. 2 Peter 1, 12. And it says, But be ye established in present truth. 2 Peter 1, 12. Then Alan White writes in early writings, page 63, paragraph 2, There are many pre precious truths contained in the Word of God, but it is present truth that the flock needs now. Not past truth, present truth. Present truth is this, where is Jesus? He's in the most holy place. In the heavenly sanctuary, in the most holy place, He did not go there in eight, uh, when He ascended. And so we see that there is a message that we need to bear. Now, Jeremiah chapter 3, are we there? Finally, why is God so hung up? Why does, God, why does God's heart break? Go there with me. Jeremiah chapter 3, are we there? The Bible says this. Turn to uh, verse 14. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 14. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 14. The Bible says this. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord. For I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to where? To Zion. God has said to his people, turn back to me. Why are you backsliding children? Because I am married to you. It's a relationship. It's a relationship. It's a relationship, friends. It's a relationship. Now, notice this quotation. Write this down. This is powerful. Do you remember when Jesus said, this is not the quote, but I'm going to quote it. Do you remember when Jesus said in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, Husbands, love, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Right? So the marriage covenant, the marriage relation, compares Jesus and the church, and he says the same union, two-way union, that exists in a marriage is the same union I want in a spiritual relationship with me. Does that make sense? It's both ways, not one way. It's both ways. Who would like to be, I'm not married, so I can't talk. But who would like to be in a marriage where only the wife talks to the husband and the husband doesn't talk to the wife? That's a pretty bad relationship. That's pretty boring. I know, Tanya, if Josh didn't talk to you, you'd be like, Josh, what are you doing, man? And Josh, if, you know, Tanya, Tanya, you know, like, come on, man, like, this is, a, this is a relationship. God is saying the same thing. Two ways. Now, notice this quote. This is powerful. Before I read this on the screen, actually, I'm going to read this quote. Those who think of the result of hastening or hindering the gospel, think of it in relation to what? Themselves, themselves and to the what? To the, to the world. Few think of its what? Relation to who? God. To God. Few give thought to the suffering that sin has caused our Creator. All heaven suffered in Christ's agony, but that suffering did not begin or end with His manifestation in humanity. The cross is a revelation to our dull senses of the pain that from its very inception, sin has brought to what? The heart of God. The heart of God. God's heart breaks too. Every departure from the right, every deed of cruelty, every failure of humanity to reach His ideal brings grieved to him, hence Genesis 6, 6, and it grieved the Lord at his heart. Because think about it, why did God grieve? When man's thoughts were continually evil and wicked, God's heart grieved. Amen? Amen. That's, why the, the, that's why it says here, every departure from the right, because man's state in the flood was continual sin from the mind, action, and life. And even though man did that, God felt it. How fair is that? For man to go and fornicate and go murder, and God feels the pain. How fair is that? Many times we say, why, is there, why do bad things happen to good people? Friends, why do bad things happen to a good God? Why? Why should God suffer 
for consequences that we bring upon ourselves. Yet God does. Out of love. And it says here, this is deep. Our world is a vast laser house, a scene of misery that we dare not allow even our thoughts to dwell upon. It says, did we realize it as it is, the burden would be too terrible, yet God feels what? Feels it all. In order to destroy sin and its results, he gave his best beloved and he has put it in whose power? Our power, through cooperation with him, to bring the sin of misery to an end. How? This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached where? In all the world, for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Paul said clearly, How shall they believe in whom they have not heard? How shall they hear, and if, 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 how shall they hear except the preacher be sent? And how shall he preach except he be sent? And God said, blessed are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace, that bring glad tidings of good things. To, uh, good, of good things. Now, as I close, the satisfactions of true friendship are possible because of mutual need and mutual fulfillment of need. And through all these human relations, God seeks to reveal himself to us. He longs to have us understand not only what he means to us, but what we mean to him. One of the greatest needs in the human heart is to feel needed. To feel the need of this one we love, to know that one feels our need, this constitutes the basis of true fellowship. If you had a marriage that only the man felt like he needed the wife, but the wife did not feel like she needed the man. That's not a relationship. A relationship is when one feels the need of the other, and so vice versa. Amen? Amen. You want a relationship like that. Friends too. You don't want to be friends with people that don't want to be friends with you. Obviously, like in that way, like, I'm not saying you shouldn't love your enemies, but it's very hard to do that. God said, love your enemies. But it says here, this the husband and wife who have such an experience enjoy a foretaste of heaven. The point is this. Do you know God feels like he needs you? God feels like he needs you. Do you know many times this is what breaks God's heart? This is what breaks his heart. Not so much, and it is, we need God, amen? But friends, God feels like he needs us. That's why Jesus was willing even to go to the tomb, not knowing whether he would come out of that. Because he was willing to do that which love does. And love feels a need for love. And this is so deep because many times we preach that you, sinner, need Jesus. That's true. Amen? Amen. But friends, how deep is it to know that yes, the sinner needs Jesus because of his foolishness and sin. But a holy, infinite God feels like he needs you and me. How deep the Father's love for us. His sin upon, my sin upon his shoulders that saved all of us. And friends, the appeal was this. As we read clearly, the Bible said from the beginning, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall what? The end to come. But then we saw that we want the end to come, amen? amen? We don't want no more issues, no more murders, no more rapes, no more sin. But God says the gospel must go to the world. Why? Because the gospel is the power of God unto what? Salvation. Unto what? Salvation to who? To those that? Believe. To who? Everyone. To everyone that believeth. But then Paul says, how shall they believe except they what? Hear. And how shall they hear except there be a preacher? And how shall there be a preacher except to be sent? Then God told us that this is why we hear it in this generation. Because we're equipping to be those people that preach the gospel of peace and bring about the end. And then Paul said clearly, why the end? Because at the end there will be no more suffering, pain, or death. Not just for man, but for who? For God. Because God's heart breaks too. And then we see that our gospel commission in this generation is that God is calling a people to not mimic Usher, to not go around mimicking all these celebrities, so reading novels, spending time in video games and all these foolishness. 
God has called a remnant to stand for truth, prison truth. And Alan White writes in Education 271, with such an army of workers as our youth rightly trained, and friends, this is why we're here in this generation, because we want to be rightly trained. To be those people that bring about the suffering. Friends, that tells us, as I pray, you and I have the power in our hands by God's cooperation to bring this foolishness to an end. Do we not want to go home? Amen? Amen. Now, what are we going to do about it? What are you and I going to do individually to carry this message to the world? And if it's your desire, as I pray, to say to the Lord, Lord, here am I, send me. I'm going to pray and just close this message and Josh is going to announce the final song. But if you want to say to the Lord, Lord, here am I, send me, because the Lord is saying, who shall go for us? I want to ask you to stand to your feet. If you want to make a commitment to God, to say, Lord, here am I, send me. And to say, Lord, it's not just because of my pain, but because of your pain. I want you to stand to your feet as I pray. I'm going to pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you so much that you've told us that you see us as your bride, that you see us so precious, that you, you see us um, as your bride and that you're married to us. And Father, we want to thank you so much that you feel like you need us, just as probably way infinitely more than we feel that we need you, Lord. But Father, we just want to thank you so much that in the suffering world, that we are not alone in the suffering. You have told us that you are suffering more intensely than we could ever imagine. And Father, we want to thank you so much that not only will this gospel work go to the world and it will bring about an end of suffering for us, but it will also bring about an end of suffering for thee, for you. Lord, we thank you so much that in all this suffering, we know that you are acquainted with our griefs. You have carried our sorrows and you have borne them for us, Lord. Father, thank you for hearing our prayer. Thank you for being with us, Lord. We know that this world is in havoc and you need to send people. And you're asking us today, Lord, how shall the people believe and hear if no preachers are sent? So, Father, here we are. Send us. Take our lives and let them be consecrated, Lord, to thee. May we be faithful gospel mission, missionaries in this generation so that we can go home and that we can no longer break your heart, Lord but that we can fulfill the needs of your heart, which is to have every single one of us there. Thank you for your love and thank you for your mercy. We pray this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.